we're talking about uh, the basics of ciphers. Ciphers are the algorithms for it, encrypting and decrypting our information, and we're talking about classical ciphers, ones which are very old, but just demonstrate the basic concepts. And last week we gave an example of the Caesar cipher. We just, if we, our input can be any of uh, any lowercase English letter, one of 26 values, then the Caesar cipher, the output ciphertext, we shift by k positions, where we need to wrap around if, if we get to z uh, and we come back to a, for example. So that's the general concept. We can express that mathematically, but I think most people understand that. And of course, to decrypt, we do the opposite. With decryption, we must get the original plain text back. It's no good if I start with plain text, encrypt, and then someone decrypts with the right key but doesn't get the plain text back. That's unsuccessful. So the decryption with the Caesar cipher, we shift back to the left. So we had an example of that. Uh, there are many other classical ciphers. Um, I'm just selecting two here just to demonstrate some concepts. Caesar cipher was a substitution cipher. That shift effectively means we substitute one letter with, with another letter from the alphabet or from the character set. So the character set is our 26 letters. We encrypted, and I, what did we encrypt? We encrypted Hello Steve as our plain text last week. We had a key of D or three, and the cipher text, the first letters were K-H-O-O-R, and so on. So the first letter of plain text was, was H, the first letter of cipher text was K. K is, K is not in the plain text. Hello Steve does not have the letter K. What we did is we substitute the letter H in the plain text with the letter K in the cipher text. That's a substitution. We take one letter of the plain text and replace it with a letter of the uh, possible character set. Character set. In general, we don't have to replace just one letter with one other. We can replace a set of letters with a set of other letters, and it can be more complex. So the, the cipher tells us how do we replace, how do we substitute one for another. Another operation is transposition. We rearrange the characters. Rail fence, simple example of a transposition cipher. You take your plain text letters, you write them in rows, but re, you write it uh, doesn't have to be in diagonals, but you write um, the first letter on the first row, the second letter of the plain text on the second row, the third letter of the plain text on the third row, the kth letter of the plain text on the kth row. And then you go back to the first row. And then you get the cipher text by reading row by row. Let's show an example. Uh, quick example to, to illustrate, just to remind us what we had with the Caesar cipher. We had our plain text from last week. And we took our key to be the letter D, which is last week, or the number 3. If we Remember, we're just mapping letters to numbers. And we got our cipher text with the Caesar cipher, so using Caesar, we got something like K H O. So you should have this already. H Y H. And now let's try a different one. Rail fence. All right. It's similar plain text, but a little bit longer. It will help with the example. And let's add another word at the end. That's our plain text. We're going to use the rail fence cipher. And let's take a key of three for simplicity. 
Here our key is a number. It indicates the number of rows we're going to write our plain text in. So to get the ciphertext, what we do is we write the plain text, the first letter on the first row, the second letter on the second row, third letter on the third row, and then back to the first row. Uh, so we can visualize it like this. So we just spell it out. H, E, L, so three rows, and come back to the first row. L, O, S, T, E, V, E, S, E. Someone tell me when I make a mistake. Uh, C, U, R, I, T, Y. So we do that. And to get the ciphertext, we read r the row one at a time. So the first row is H L T E C I. Now the first six letters of the ciphertext. So I've just written the plain text in rows. And now we read row one, row two, row three to give us our ciphertext. This L so our rail fence cipher, where the key is the number of rows. If we had a key of four, we'd write it in four rows. And if we um, We'll leave it there. This is a transposition cipher. So there's, there's nothing complex about the cipher. It's just showing the different operation of we've taken the plain text and we've followed some algorithm that rearranges the plain text. If you look at the cipher text, the same letters appear as in the plain text. We haven't substituted, we haven't replaced, we've just rearranged the letters. So there were, what, one H two L's, there's one H and two L's in the ciphertext. There's no difference in the set of letters. Whereas in our Caesar cipher we have different set of letters in the ciphertext. So this is demonstrating our two basic operations, substitution and transposition. Very simple. Many real ciphers use these operations. But they uh, will see more complex in that we repeat the operation. Easy to break. What do you need to do to break to find the plain text given the ciphertext? If you don't know the key, what do you do? Oh, you want to? Oh, you could brute force. Okay, we can always brute force. Uh, well, how how could you? So that brute force is try all keys. Well, what keys have we got? One row? Well, one row, if we just wrote it in one row and read it off in one row, our cipher text would equal the plain text. Two rows, three rows, four rows, uh, any number of rows we could have written it in. But of course, with the length, uh, the number of rows cannot be greater than the number of characters. So try all rows. Uh, But again, when it, we have a longer uh, plain text, to instead of trying all rows, all keys, then try and be a little bit more intelligent and determine what the likely key is. That's cryptanalysis. To, to use some knowledge of the algorithm and some knowledge of the uh, structure in plain text and ciphertext to try and uh, estimate what the key is without trying all possible keys. And similar to Caesar cipher, and we'll see most ciphers uh, in the classical ciphers, their structure in the cipher text looks random, but if you had a very long plain text message, and most plain text messages are not a simple short two, three words, but maybe quite long, 
then if there's some structure in the original plain text with a transposition cipher, we just rearrange that plain text so there's still some structure left in that original that output cipher text. And the structure here is the number of letters, the frequency of particular letters. In any language, some letters occur more frequently than others. In English, the letter E occurs more frequently than any other letter. In general, if we look at many texts, I'll give you some statistics uh, shortly, but E occurs more frequently if we look at a very long text. So if E is the most frequent letter in the plain text with a transposition cipher, E will be the most frequent letter in the cipher text. We don't hide that structure when we do a transposition. So that doesn't add any security of hiding that structure. We'll see with different substitution ciphers we can start to hide the structure. So what good is a transposition rearranging letters? Uh, we'll see that by combining substitutions and transpositions, that is do a substitution and then a transposition and then repeat another substitution, another, another transposition, we can get a much more complex cipher. That is, the cipher text is much harder to see the structure compared to the plain text. So let's try and move on to that. And so far we've just shown two examples of the, the main operations used in many cy ciphers, many block ciphers. Substitution and transposition. Let's look at another uh, variation of the Caesar cipher. With the Caesar cipher, we use one key and each letter is shifted by that value of the key. So each letter is shifted by three positions. Okay. Very easy to break the Caesar cipher. A simple extension of the Caesar cipher is to use a key which is not just one value but multiple values. Where each value of the key, for example a word, each value of the key determines how much each corresponding plain text letter shifts by. I'll demonstrate that and then we'll talk about this cipher. A simple extension of the Caesar cipher. And let me get a nice example. Let's stick with our original, our plain text from Hello Steve Security. And now our key is not a, a single letter, but a word. Okay, so we think of a word. Um, anyone? Choose a key. Not very imaginative, are we, today? A key, a word. Someone choose a word. Love, okay. So, same as the Caesar cipher, each letter in the key corresponds to a number. I'll show you the numbers in a moment, the mapping, so you can remember. And what we do to get this, the cipher text is we apply the Caesar cipher, so we take the plain text H, the key L, and get our cipher text using the Caesar cipher. And the next plain text letter, E, we use the key O to get the cipher text, L with V, L with E, and now we repeat the key, or the key word in this case. We repeat it enough times such that we'll have characters in the key the uh, same number as in the plain text. Uh, what have we got in the plain text?
there are what twenty. One, four, 20 letters in our plain text. Our key is four letters, so we need you to repeat it five times. I haven't lined it up very well. You'll do it better. And to get the cipher text, what we do, take H and L, and we use a Caesar, Caesar cipher on them. Now let's bring up our mapping of letters to numbers. Uh, let's find it first. Just a different cipher. We'll see how useful it is in a moment. So just remember for example, we've got H and L, so H is 7, L is 11. I'll write the numbers for the first case. H is the number 7, L is 11, which means we take the letter H and shift by 11 positions to the right to encrypt with the Caesar cipher. So we take with H, shift by 11 positions to the right, brings us to 18, okay, S. So the output ciphertext will be S for the first letter. 7 plus 11, 18 or S. For the second letter, E and O. So E and O, E is 4, O is 14, so we take the letter E and shift it 14 positions to the right, brings us to where? 4 plus 14, yeah, 18 again, S, just by chance. Okay, So this shift to the right is just add the key, if we think about the, the numbers. E is 4, the key uh, is 14, so the ciphertext is 18, 4 plus 14, or S. What's the next letter in the ciphertext? where L and V are the inputs. Work out the next letter in the ciphertext. The plain text letter is L, the key letter is V. What is the ciphertext letter? And if you're trying to shift the, all the positions, yeah, you'll get there. Anyone have the letter? Easy, rather than shifting to the right, you can do that. It's easier sometimes to think of this cipher mathematically. And what we do is we really add the plain text number to the key number. But to wrap around, when we get to the end, we the mathematical operation is we mod by 26. Because we have 26 characters, we bring it back to zero. Once we get to the value 26, it actually corresponds to zero. So we have what? L is 11 and V is 21. So we take L, shift 21 positions to the right, which brings us to position 11 plus 21, 32. Okay, 11 plus 21, position 32. But we only go up to 25, so 32 mod 26 is 6. It would bring us wrap around to G, letter 6 in that case. So the output ciphertext would be G, which is really just 11 plus 21 mod 26. 32 mod 26 is 6, or the letter G. And we keep going. 
Again, it's just a Caesar cipher, but now the key letter is changing each character of the plaintext. Uh, L and E, the fourth letter, we'll do that and then we'll stop. L is plaintext, E is the key letter, L is 11, E is 4, 11 plus 4 is 15, the ciphertext letter is 15 or P in that case. And I'm not going to do the rest. The point isn't the details of this algorithm. We'll see the point as we uh, analyze and compare. So apply the Caesar cipher, but change the key. Now what the user needs to do is choose a key. We think of this as the key word. Love is the key word, and the algorithm says we just repeat the key word to generate the key uh, such that the key is as long as the plain text. Now let's compare a little bit about using the plain Caesar cipher and this, this modified. Just look at the first word, hello, and in fact the first four letters. In our normal Caesar cipher, look at the first four letters, H-E-L-L. -L. When we have two L's in the plain text, look at the cipher text. The two L's map to two O's. So with the normal Caesar cipher, each plain text letter mapped always to the same cipher text letter. In this case, whenever we have an E, we get a H as an output. Whenever we have an L, we get an O as an output. That's the Caesar cipher. The problem with that is that now what an attacker can do is look at the cipher text and try and work out, based upon the expected statistics of frequencies of letters, that normally I guess that the most common letter in plain text is E. And therefore the most common letter in the cipher text is H. Let's guess that H corresponds to E. And it makes it very easy for the attacker to guess, or not to guess, to, to work out the plain text without trying all keys. Whereas if we look at this new modified Caesar cipher, when we have repetitions in the plain text, and the, two, the simple example here is the two L's, look at the cipher text, we get different letters as output, G and P. So even though we have repetitions in the plain text, we don't necessarily get repetitions in the cipher text. And that increases the security of the cipher. It makes it harder for the attacker to look at the cipher text and determine the, the plain text. This cipher is called the Vision Air cipher. Okay. Um, maybe on one of the, I don't think it's on one of the slides, but it's just a modification of the Caesar cipher. Uh, It's almost perfect in that it's almost if it's almost the case which it's impossible for the attacker to find the plain text given the cipher text. There's one limitation though. If we try and line up our letters, and I didn't do it very well, but every four letters we're going to repeat the Did I do that right? Yes? Ah, okay. Every four letters we repeat the key. Now, the problem with this is that if we look, so now we know. With the two L's, since we have two different key letters, we'll get output which is different. Okay, that's useful. But look at this case. We have an E and an E. And then here, another E and E, that output will be the same because we take the same input plain text letter and using the same key letter, we'll get the same cipher text letter. And the result is that there's still some patterns or some structure in the cipher text. 
because let's imagine this is very long now. Again, E is the most frequent letter in the plain text. Then every time there's this E encrypted with the same letter in the key, right, we have two occurrences here, maybe there are others later, we'll get the same ciphertext letter as output. And the attacker can use that knowledge to try and guess, okay, this output letter occurs the most frequently, most likely that corresponds to E. And they use statistics of the, the plain text to try and work out and guess the length of the keyword. And once they guess the length of the keyword, they can start to try and guess what the keyword is. So it turns out it's quite easy to, to break this cipher. But it's better than the Caesar cipher because we produce in many cases more variations in the ciphertext, even when we have the same input plaintext. So the problem with this cipher is that we use a keyword which is shorter than the plaintext. Okay? And we have to repeat the keyword. As a result, we may get repetitions in the ciphertext. How to make this cipher better? Any suggestions? Use a keyword as a sentence. So don't just use a word, use a longer uh, a sentence, for example. What if, uh, imagine our plain text is a one megabyte file, a lot of text, a large document. What, what do you do for your key? A long, long sentence? Or, but if it's a sentence of, say, 10 words, it still will have repetition. So if your plain text is a large file, millions of characters, if you use a sentence, for your keyword, you'll still have to repeat the keyword and you'll still get potential repetitions in the ciphertext. So what do you do? You choose a keyword which is as long as the plaintext. So if I've got a one megabyte file to encrypt, I choose a keyword, a key, which is one megabyte in length. And even better, you make it random. You don't choose a word, you choose a random set of characters. If you do that, if you choose a keyword which is the same length as the plain text and random, completely random, then the cipher text will be unbreakable. It's the perfect cipher. Unbreakable in that there's no information that an attacker can use to get the plain text without the key and unbreakable in terms of you can't do a brute force attack on it. In theory, you can't do a brute force attack. So it's the perfect cipher of simply, again, use the Caesar cipher, but make sure the key is as long as the plain text and random. It's called the one-time pad. Perfect cipher, unbreakable security, but very... Uh, impractical. The main reason it's not relevant, it's not uh, used in practice, is because I've got a one megabyte plain text. I need to choose a one megabyte key. And I must deliver that one megabyte key to you beforehand so you can decrypt that one megabyte file. Or in other words, I've got a five gigabyte DVD I want to encrypt. The key itself must be five gigabytes as well. Okay? It's very inefficient to distribute that key to people. If the key was a word, I could write it down on a piece of paper and give it to you, and then you could decrypt. But if a key is a five gigabyte random sequence, how do I give it to you? Well, it's very inefficient. So the problem with this perfect cipher is the key is too long. And the key must be random. Generating random values all the time is hard and we'll come to random numbers later but to generate continuously uh, different random numbers is not easy. So we've gone a little bit off of what we're, the lecture notes and what we're intending to cover but uh, we can take the Caesar cipher, the simplest cipher, modify it a little bit, use a long random key and we'll get a perfect cipher. But the trade-off always that occurs in security is that 
perfect security, impractical for use, inconvenient, okay? Inconvenient for performance and, and, uh, and for usage. Hence, it's not used very often. It's only used for very short texts or very secure applications. Let's uh, give some more examples, but instead of doing it on here, I've got some software that will calculate for us, save us some time. Um, let's see. What have I got? I've got a book that I've downloaded in plain text. It's just, um, I don't know what it was. Some free book, many uh, characters in it. Um, let's count the letters. I've got some software called Crypto which uh, does different classical operations. One of them is it counts letters of the book. Take some time counts all the letters and, and shows me the count of the letters here. Uh, okay, so the letter A occurred 36,000 times in that, that book, E 54,000 times, Q 437 times. Okay, fine. We can do that on any source. So just, just one example. Let's be a bit more convenient and sort it. Uh, based on percentages, not based upon the absolute values, but the percentage of all letters. Of all the letters in this book, E occurs 12% of the time. E is the most frequent letter in this book. T occurs 9% of the time. The next most frequent letter. And C, we, we see the most frequent letters in this English book. And I don't show the, the lowest letters, but you'll see what? Q, X uh, will be the bottom two, I think, usually. They're very infrequent. Okay. This is typical of most English texts. You can do the analysis of other books or other sources, or you can collect a thousand books and do the analysis of all of them, and you'll see E is usually the most frequent letter. You do it in Thai language. Different character set, you'll see a character is the most frequent. Some are more frequent than others in any language. Okay. Uh, we can do it not just on letters, but on pairs of letters called digrams. If we look at a, each pair of letters, the most frequent pair of letters, TH occurs the most frequently in this example. And then on triples of letters or trigrams. THE occurs the most frequency, frequently in this book. In other sources it may vary a little bit, but there will always be usually some, some common uh, trigrams towards the top and some down the bottom which are very, very, very infrequent or, or don't occur at all. The attacker uses this knowledge to break the Caesar cipher, uh, the Vision Air cipher, uh, and other classical ciphers. Because what they do is they look at, well, what occurs most frequently in the cipher text? And then starts to try and map back. Okay, if this is the most frequent letter in the cipher text, then that maybe most likely corresponds to E in the plain text and does the mapping backwards to work out what the key was to get that letter that became E. This is called frequency analysis and it can be done on uh, most plain text, not just on English, on different languages. And similar, on, uh, similar approaches are used on images and on other files which have some structure and the attacker uses that structure in the plain text to try and work out, given the ciphertext only, what the key and what the plaintext was. When we encrypt, we'd like ciphertext that doesn't have any structure. 
And by not having structure, we think, okay, is completely random. Uh, for example, if we encrypt this book, we'd like ciphertext where the frequency of each letter is about the same. That is, the letter E occurs the same frequency with the letter Z and the letter Q and the letter T. Because if they all occur about the same, then it's there's and in different positions, then it, there's no structure in the ciphertext. So that's our, our goal. Uh, just to finish this. Um, let's give one more. I'll give an example where you can go and read about it yourself. I will not go through it here. Um, I've, on this website, and it's, it's linked to from our course website, it lists a Caesar cipher, and we do a brute force attack on a Caesar cipher, that's easy, try all 26 keys, and we take uh, from the 26 possible plaintext, we find 17 meet in lobby at 10 as the, the correct one, so we we can do a brute force attack, but more complex analysis can be done by looking at the letter frequency, the frequency of E's, and this explains, this is just worth reading in your own time, it's, it's uh, too hard to go through in, in the lecture, but the example takes some ciphertext, some longer ciphertext, using a cipher with 26 to the 26 factorial possible keys, a brute force is not possible, but we, as the attacker, look at the frequency of letters in the ciphertext and we see T is the most frequent in the ciphertext and then we start to make guesses. Okay, if T is the most frequent in ciphertext, most likely that corresponds to E in the plaintext. So T maps back to E and use similar analysis and go through some steps and again it's hard to see on the screen but you go through steps and you start to take the ciphertext and start to work out letters in the ciphertext mapping back to the plaintext and then you start to recognize words like this and internet and it takes 10-20 minutes by hand to work out the, ciphertext, uh, the plaintext. So d using this frequency of letters, it's very easy on these classical ciphers to do an attack. With some computer support, it's almost instantaneous. Okay? You can program to, to do an, an attack for you. Except for this one-time pad, uh, which is perfect in terms of you cannot do such an attack. So I'm going off, uh, have a look at that in your own time, I think, that one. I want to come back to our lecture notes. Ah, no, one more example before the lecture notes. Sorry. I've done a similar attack where I took a plain text, okay, and I counted the letters in the plain text. There are about well, five, well, there were exactly 552 letters in my example plain text to start with, and I encrypted it. 
If I look and analyze the plain text and looked at the, the most frequent letters through to the least frequent, the most frequent letter, the first letter, there were something like 74 occurrences. The least frequent letters, well, there are zero occurrences. And that this plot is showing from the most frequent through to the least frequent letters. It's not saying what letters they were. That's not the point. It's showing that the blue line for the plain text indicates that with our original plain text, some letters were more frequent than others. Okay. And then I encrypted that plain text using the Vision Air cipher, the, the extension of the Caesar cipher that we just uh, covered. I encrypted it. And then I encrypted it again using the rail fence transposition cipher, the one where we write in, in rows. So it's Vision Air and then rail fence. And I looked at the output and I say that's after round one, the red one. And what happened is that there were still some letters which occur much more frequently than others. So the first few letters, there are about 40 instances of the most frequent letter. And there were some letters, or all letters occurred in the output, and there were, what, five or ten occurrences. But then I encrypted again using the same cipher, the vision air and the rail fence, I applied it again on the output of the first set of encryption, the first round. So after encrypting again, round two, the most frequent letter occurred about 30 times. And the least frequent about 10 or 11 times. And then I encrypted again. And after round three, the green one, the most frequent letter here and the least frequent here. What's happening, we see after repeating the encryptions, so we take some plain text, encrypt, and again, and again, the resulting output cipher text, if we look at the frequency of letters, is becoming more spread out. That is, some of the, the there's not so many letters which are the much more outstanding than others, much more frequent than others we see a flattening of this curve. An ideal case would be to keep going from a security perspective, the ideal output would be that each letter occurs an uh, equal number of times. That's this horizontal line here. That is about 21 times. So 552 letters, 26 in total, 552 divided by 26 is about 21. The ideal case for security would be this solid line. What we see is if we start with a plain text, it's nowhere near that. There are some more frequent letters. But as we encrypt, and we encrypt again and again and again, we get closer and closer to this ideal case. And this is demonstrating the concept which is used by many real ciphers today. They take simple operations, substitution, transposition, and they apply them on the plain text. And then they apply them again in a second round. And again, and again, and again, such that the resulting cipher text as an output is, looks completely random and does not have any statistics like the input plain text does. That is, it approaches this horizontal line. A completely random ciphertext would have the same number of A's as the number of Z's. Whereas if it's random, then one should not occur more frequently than another. That is this horizontal line. I haven't showed you the steps for doing this. I'm just trying to explain the concept that is used in ciphers now. And there's two main points. Most or many block ciphers use substitutions and transpositions. Substitutions, replace one character with some other character. Transposition, rearrange characters in the input. And they repeat those operations. So they make take very simple operations and repeat them and repeat them and repeat them. And we can get very secure ciphers, such that it, uh, in practice only brute force attacks uh, will break them. 
And that was, if we go back to our lecture notes now, in yours I made a mistake. I had the Caesar cipher here, but I've changed that to Vision Air cipher. We're not going to do it, but that's what my plot was from. I took some plain text, I applied the Vision Air cipher. What is the Vision Air cipher? It's that modification of the Caesar cipher where we use love as the keyword. Okay. Take that and then apply the rail fence. And then do it again, those two steps again. That's round one and then again round two and again round three and start looking at the output. And I did that for an example to get the plot that I showed before. We will not do it in class. It's called a product system. We have multiple rounds of transpositions and substitutions. Let's get on to real ciphers. Uh, I'll just see if we have an example. Oh, we'll come back to this one, but here's DES. Here's a real cipher. Been one of the most popular ciphers in the world. It's no longer recommended. We'll talk about the limitations and we'll come back to it in a moment. But DES, it, you don't have to understand this, just trying to show you some concepts. This is the encryption stage. And it's broken into rounds. There were 16 rounds in DES. Each round we do the same steps. We take some input, apply some operations, some substitutions and transpositions, get some output and repeat. Okay. In the similar before, I showed the case after round one, round two, round three, we just repeat the same steps. And DES did it 16 times. What do we do in each step in DES? Round one, for example, is this green box. Well, again, you don't have to understand this, but these blocks, and are hard to read here, some are transpositions, or called permutations. Permutation is a trans transposition, rearrange. And some are substitutions. And a permutation, sometimes referred to as a, a box that does permutations, is a P box. And a box that does substitutions is an S box. And if you study the, the details of DES, you'll see the S boxes and P boxes are all that's performed in here. So these blocks correspond to substitutions and transpositions. And there are only, what, five or six blocks in here. And that makes up one round. And then in the second round, we just do the same again. And we do it 16 times in DES. DES is a real cipher which just uses the same concepts of the classical ciphers. The details we will not go into. So let's go back and, and talk more generally. Summarize from an attacker's perspective. The aim of the attacker is to find the plain text or the key and or the key. If you find the key, you can automatically get the plain text. And if you can find the key, then you can potentially get future plain text very easily. Okay, so two people are communicating and they're sending many messages over a, a period of a week or a month and they're using the same key. So if I'm the attacker and after two days I intercept a message and I decrypt and get the plain text, well, that's good. I've broken and I've found their plain text. But even better if I can find the key they're using, because now I can, of course, find the plain text for that one message, but all future messages which they encrypt using that key, I can easily decrypt. So finding the key is a benefit. We assume the attacker knows the cipher text. They can discover the cipher text. They know the cipher being used, the algorithm. And that the attacker, in some cases, may know about pairs of plain text and ciphertext, which were encrypted using the same key that we're trying to discover. Uh, for example, uh, some military organisation are sending secret messages about uh, upcoming attacks. 
Okay, and the plain text messages start. Uh, 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 send a bomb to x y coordinates at time z. Okay, that's the structure of the plain text. To say to send uh, a message to whoever to send the bomb or send the missile. Okay, but the plain text message is containing the coordinates and the time for the attack, for a future attack, so instructions. But they encrypt that plain text with some key and send the ciphertext. Someone, the attacker wants to intercept the ciphertext and work out when the upcoming attack is going to be and where, so they can move, for example. So they encrypt some ciphertext. They cannot read it, they cannot decrypt. But then they see that t tomorrow the bomb lands in this XY coordinates at this time. So even though they didn't decrypt the ciphertext to get the plain text, they have the ciphertext and now they know what the plain text was. Because they know that the bomb went off in these coordinates and at this time, so that they know the original plain text must have say, said that send the bomb these XY coordinates and at this time. So in some cases the attacker can work out what the plain text would have been after the fact. Not very useful in that case, because the bomb's already exploded. But in future cases, now they can use that information that this plain text mapped to this ciphertext. But they still don't have the key. They know a pair of plain text and ciphertext. They don't know the key. They want to discover the key. It turns out by knowing pairs of plaintext ciphertext can help you in finding the key and can help you for finding the plaintext for future ciphertext values. So sometimes in some attacks, in practical attacks, the attacker may know pairs of plaintext ciphertext but not know the key. What does the attacker do? Brute force, try all possible keys. How do you prevent that? Make sure the key space is large enough such that a trying them all will take too long or will be too costly. <coughs> Cryptanalysis, exploit some characteristics in the algorithm to work out what the plain text or key is. So the frequency analysis of those simple ciphers is cryptanalysis. It's not doing brute force, it's using some structure and the knowledge of the algorithm to work backwards from the ciphertext to find the plain text and or the key. And we assume that the attacker, if they decrypt and find some possible plain text, they can recognize which one's the correct one. So now let's move into, given these concepts, move into real ciphers and specifically symmetric key encryption. I think we've seen this picture or very similar before. Symmetric key encryption, sender and receiver use the same key. So there's symmetry between the keys. We take some plain text, we have a cipher, we encrypt that plain text using a shared secret key K. We send the cipher text to the recipient. They decrypt the cipher text using the same key as what was used for encryption. So K and K are the same values, so it's a shared value, just one value. So this is symmetric key encryption, it's commonly used for uh, data confidentiality and uh, encryption in many cases. So for it to work we need a good algorithm to encrypt, a strong algorithm such that if the attacker knows the ciphertext, they know the algorithms, it must be hard for them to find the key or the plaintext. Even if they know pairs of past plaintext and ciphertext, somehow they've discovered some ciphertext values and the corresponding plaintext, but they don't know the key yet, it should be hard for them to find the key. And for this to work, the key must be, of course, secret. If 
someone yells out the, the key in the class, then it's no longer considered a secret between the two users. So you, the, the key must be secret, otherwise the system fails. Symmetric key encryption, there are two, we distinguish between two types, block ciphers and stream ciphers. So the algorithms we use, block and stream ciphers. Block are the main ones. And the difference between block and ci stream ciphers is on how much plain text do we operate at a time. So what we do is we take some plain text, encrypt, and get ciphertext. If and we only operate on a particular length of input plaintext. Block ciphers typically 64 or 128 bits. There are some variations, but 64 is common, which means we take 64 bits of plaintext, encrypt to get ciphertext using our algorithm, and then if we have more plaintext to encrypt, we operate 64 bits at a time. Encrypt the next 64 bits encrypt the next 64 bits and so on until we're finished. Stream ciphers usually operate one byte at a time. They take eight bits at a time and encrypt. It turns out that the algorithms used are, are, are slightly different. Generally stream ciphers can be implemented much faster, to be much faster than block ciphers. Uh, at least in the past. Nowadays that there's not much difference in terms of performance that uh, they're becoming very similar in performance uh, and stream ciphers and block ciphers are used for many uh, of the same purposes. Let's forget about stream ciphers for now. The main use of ciphers is it of block ciphers. We'll see one example of a stream cipher a little bit later. One of the most popular block ciphers in real use was the data encryption standard, DES. Developed or designed, what, 30, 40 years ago in the US. And was developed as a standard for the US government, which meant all the government departments in the US had to use it to encrypt their data. And it meant that many other countries used it because they want to interoperate with the US organizations. So DES become a worldwide, uh, or use worldwide. It operates on 64 bits at a time. So in our classical ciphers, I was using examples of letters, our 26 letters of English. Our real ciphers operate on binary values. And what DES did is we take our plain text as binary, and we take 64 bits, apply the DES algorithm to encrypt to get some ciphertext and 64 bits of ciphertext is produced and then take the next 64 bits of plain text and encrypt with DES. So we operate at a block at a time. If So our input plain text now we assume is binary. Okay. So if it's some text message we map say using an ASCII table, the, the characters to uh, bits. DES used a key length of effectively 56 bits. The key was actually 64 bits, but 8 were not used for encryption. So it meant effectively there was 56 bits in the key. Okay. Now, a brute force attack. Try all keys. How many keys? In DES, how many do we need to try? 2 to the power of 56. If there are 56 bits in a key, then how many possible key values are there? Well, we can vary the bits between 0 and 1, so it becomes 2 to the power of 56 possible key values. So in theory, a brute force attack on DES requires an attacker to try and decrypt 2 to the power of 56 times. Do we have a table that showed those numbers? Uh, have we gone through it? Sorry, I jump ahead a few slides. 
if our key length is 56 bits, there are 2 to the power of 56 possible keys. So a brute force attack on DES, in theory, what we do is we take our ciphertext, decrypt with key 1. Check the plain text, does it make sense? No. Decrypt with key 2, key 3, key 4. And we, in the worst case, we have to try all 2 to the power of 56 keys. Okay? We have to try them all. That's a brute force attack. How long does it take? So it depends upon how many keys to try and how fast our computer is that's making the decryption attempts. And we'll return to this table later, but for the DES example, a 56-bit key, if my computer can decrypt one billion times per second, it can try 10 to the power of 9 keys every second then with 2 to the power of 56 keys to try, it takes, what, seven, 2 or 3 years, 833 days of my computer trying to decrypt for a brute force attack. But if my computer would work 1,000 times faster, or maybe I had 1,000 computers, or 1,000 uh, times the money to spend on the computers, then it would take just 20 hours to do a brute force attack on deaths. And if it was a million times faster than this, I'd do it in a, a minute. Okay. We'll come back to the, some further examples of brute force, but the 56-bit key of deaths turns out to be too short to withstand brute force attacks. Computers nowadays can do it in minutes, hours. I'll show some examples later of, of computers which are built originally to be just for breaking deaths. Let's go back to deaths. So it had a key length effectively of 56 bits. It does permutation, some initial and final permutation. A permutation is a transposition, rearrange characters, rearrange bits. 16 rounds. Each round involves permutations and substitutions, transpositions and substitutions. The simple operations that we saw demonstrated with the Caesar and Railfence cipher, more complicated, but the same concepts are used in DES. Uh, let's not worry about Feistel. Turns out decryption in DES is almost the same as encryption. And it's the advantage of that, use, we use the same algorithm to decrypt as to encrypt. We just use things in a different order. means you can implement the encryption, say in hardware or software, and you don't have to implement a separate uh, piece of software or hardware to decrypt, because it's the same. So you just implement once, and that software or hardware can both encrypt and decrypt. Yeah, that's it a practical advantage. The algorithm of DES is considered secure in most cases. It's a good design, it works well. The main problem with DES is the key length is too short, such that nowadays it's easy to do a brute force attack. So we said there are two types of attacks, brute force and cryptanalysis. Cryptanalysis takes advantage of the algorithm. Brute force is just try all keys. DES is generally considered secure from cryptanalysis. The algorithm is strong, but insecure in terms of brute force. The key length is too small. The key size is too short. And it's no longer recommended and only used in old applications. but were used for many years. Okay, so in the 70s, 80s and 90s it was very common and only started to be phased out uh, and so in the 90s and, and 2000 and so on. So that was one block cipher. The concepts of DES have been applied uh, in other ciphers. Okay, so the other ciphers have similarities to DES. One extension of DES was triple DES. Easy. 
apply DES three times and use a different key each time. So instead of having a single 56-bit key, effectively you've got a uh, what three times the length, which is 168-bit key. So a simple way to increase the key length is to encrypt multiple times. Each time you encrypt, use a different key. Uh, do I have a picture? Yeah, here. Triple DES. It was an extension of DES because many people had implementations of DES, many people used DES. It makes sense to reuse the knowledge and the software and hardware so people designed triple DES. You take your plain text, encrypt with DES, normal DES, using key 1. Then you'd apply DES again using a different key, key 2, 56 bits, 56 bits, and then key 3, 56 bits, and you get your ciphertext. So effectively your key is these three values, 3 times 56, 168 bits in length. 168 bits, and there were options to, to have a shorter key if needed. There were variations, encrypt, decrypt, encrypt, has some advantages in, in practical use, but apply DES three times. Gives us a longer key. Makes brute force practically impossible. 168 bits, again we flick forward. 56 bits took 72 seconds on my network of ultra-fast computers. Uh, 128 bits takes 10 to the power of 16 years. And triple DES has 168 bits, even, even longer. Okay. 10 to the power of 16 years, note that the universe is about 10 to the power of 10 years old. Okay. So no one's going to wait for triple DES to be broken by brute force. So a very simple extension of DES, use it three times, and brute force is solved. The problem, it's three times slower than DES. So we care always about security and performance. Every time I want to encrypt a large document, DES takes some time, triple DES takes three times as much time as DES. So that was the practical problem with triple DES. Some, some, it's used in some cases, triple DES, but no longer recommended because there are equally secure algorithms but faster, perform better. Uh, what do we skip? DES is no longer recommended. Triple DES is secure but doesn't perform so well compared to others nowadays. Uh, all right, DES operations, uh, we're not going through this, just to show that DES is really made up of multiple rounds of transpositions and substitutions. There are other ciphers, and the most common one in use today and recommended is the Advanced Encryption Standard, AE, AES. DES was developed by the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, NIST. NIST, maybe I'll skip that, DES. Standardized by NIST. It was originally designed by IBM and the NSA. Standardized by NIST, so they define how it works. And so was triple DES. So that was the improvement. And then they realized at some point that we need a better algorithm, faster, just as secure as triple DES. So what NIST did, they held some competition for people to propose designs and they selected the winner, one called Rhinedale, and in 2001 it became the standard. So it's been around for 10, 10 plus years. AES. It operates on blocks of 128 bits at a time. So if I have a one megabyte file to encrypt, AES takes the first 128 bits, encrypts, then the next 128 bits, encrypts, and so on. It allowed for different key lengths, 128, 192, 256 bits. Okay, you could choose a key length, and you can. 
still today. It used substitutions and permutations. It used a different approach than DES, but still uses our basic operations. It's used today in many applications. You'll see it in Wi-Fi, in, in wireless LANs, we encrypt your data. Many uh, disk encryption software or file encryption software now uses AES. Okay? Many internet applications make or support AES. It's a very common in software and, and hardware today. And recommended for use. And 128-bit key length is still considered secure. And some others, okay? So there are many. Some of them are listed here by different people, different uh, block lengths, different key lengths. Many of them follow a similar structure to DES called this FISAL structure. So they all follow similar design principles. Some are free to use, some have patents. Means maybe you need a license to use it, to implement in hardware or software. Some are faster than others. Okay. In the last five minutes, let's just come back to brute force attacks. So, brute force attacks. Try all keys in the key space. So we talk about the key space is the entire set of keys that we that a user can choose from. So we, how do we measure a brute force attack? Well, how long does it take? How much time does it take? Well, that depends upon how many time, how many keys we need to try and how long it takes to try one key. So how big is the key space and how fast is our computer? And usually what we do is because we don't want to count, we worry about the details of how fast the computer is, we look at the number of operations. How many, uh, if I have a ciphertext and I want to try all keys, how many decrypts do I need to do to try all keys? So I decrypt the plain text, uh, the ciphertext with key 1, there's one operation. I decrypt the ciphertext with key 2, another operation. I try all keys, how many operations do I need. So a k-bit key requires 2 to the power of k operations. And the next slide gives some examples for different key lengths. The key space, simply 2 to the power of k, you'll see in a special case down the bottom. And then I give some actual times based upon some speeds of computers. Not of any specific computer, but some numbers I say if, if we have a computer that can do one billion decryptions per second, this is approximately how long it would take to do a brute force attack. So with a 32-bit key, there are 30, 2 to the power of 32 possible keys to try. 2 to the power of 32 is about 4 billion, 4 by 10 to the power of 9. So if I can decrypt at 10 to the power of 9 keys per second, I've got 4 billion to try, I can do 1 billion per second, it takes me about 4 seconds. If my computer is 1,000 times faster, I can do 1,000 billion or 1 trillion decryptions per second, then it's going to be 1,000 times less time to, de to do a brute force attack. And 10 to the power of 15 decrypts per second. So some example numbers of time. So DES we saw nowadays is considered breakable in terms of brute force. 128 bits with 10 to the power of 15 decrypts per second still impossible to break with brute force and any longer, impossible. How fast is a computer? Uh, we're out of time, but uh, next lecture I'll show you, for example, a, a normal new PC. Uh, maybe we're talking about uh, less than a billion per second. 
okay, maybe 100 million per second. So my computer less than this. Let's say I have 10 computers and I can get 1 billion per second, then this is the speed I can get. If I have 10,000 computers, then maybe I can get this speed. And I can do it all in parallel. Or I'm a government and I can have 10 million computers or supercomputers that are equivalent to having 10 million uh, Intel CPUs, then maybe we're at this speed. Okay, with 10 million PCs decrypting all at the same time, ignoring communications between them, still impossible to break. Okay. So just look at the scale and we see 128 bits or larger impossible for brute force attacks. Let's stop there and on Thursday I'll show you another example of brute force, a real brute force attack. We'll look at some examples of how to encrypt on our computer. Don't leave yet though, just as a reminder, don't. if you leave then check the website. This week you have the practice quiz, not marked, do it in your own time, and some exercises. Again, not marked, do it in your own time. And the exercises follow from last week. I said try this virtual network software. So there's instructions there. Try it and try this open SSL software. So follow this link and you'll see an explanation. Because next week there'll be homework using these two. Okay? Homework that we assessed. So if you can't use the software, it will be much harder when you have the homework. So I'll say a bit more about it on Thursday.